All right, well, if you um, watch the video that was uploaded for uh, the Tuesday, from the Tuesday class session, you know that the topic was welfare policy. Okay? And I decided sometime between then and now <laughs> that we can have a lecture presentation, continue on with the discussion of welfare policy, but I, I don't know that there would be a lot of added value, right? So I think that I'm not going to I'm not going to lecture today, right? There, you have enough to study for the final exam, okay? So I'm going to give you some options here, right? I'm going to give you three options, right? One option is, I'll put them up on the board even so that you can think about them. Uh, one option is that uh, we dismiss and you go somewhere where you're comfortable and begin your preparation. If you, I mean, you've probably already begun, but continue your preparations for the final exam. Okay. The second option is that we have a review session for the final exam, but the review session is um, how how much we review and how long we review is dependent on your questions. So maybe you've looked at the study guide that I've had out there on the course website since the beginning of the semester. You've already started your preparations for the final exam. Some questions have occurred to you. You want to ask about those. I'm happy to field those questions. Bear in mind that I'm not going to re-lecture any of that material. But if you have some specific questions that you want to ask about SLO 5 or about SLO 2 or whatever, whichever, you know, the specific items, I'm happy to to try to answer your questions for you. That, that could be the way that we could do the review session. The third option is we have a review session it, which consists of us going back through previous quizzes and item by item, you know, and, and letting you see what the answers to those quiz items were and uh, refreshing your memory, kind of the curriculum that we went over and uh, ask any questions you have based on that. Okay, so which would you prefer? Which of these options would you prefer? Okay, one vote for number three. Number like going through the quizzes better? You guys cool with that? Okay, I'm happy to do that. That's what you want to do. But again, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of blow through these uh, unless you stop me with a specific question. Okay, because actually, I don't think we have enough time left to go through all the quizzes and have discussion of all the quizzes. So we're going to have to kind of, you know, where you, yeah, I mean, you know, just try to economize on time a little bit to get through as many of the quizzes as we possibly can. Okay, so let me uh, call up the quiz, quizzes. Um, how did I, yeah, let's, let's just go back and start at the beginning, I guess, right? You want to start with lecture quiz one, okay? So, yeah, go ahead, question. So in le if you remember, on lecture quiz one, we quizzed you over material from the first two weeks of the semester, where the topic was public policy. Okay, So let's run through these real quick. And actually, on this first one, I think the answer is already identified for you on here. Okay, So because it is a competitive pro uh, process, politics results in E, relative winners and losers. We spent a little bit of time in class emphasizing the point that it may not be, you know, you know, it may not be something that we like, but you get winners and losers in politics because the resources that people value are in scarce, right? So there's some competition, but we don't have to think about it in absolute terms, absolute winners and absolute losers, relative. Some people get relatively more, some people get relatively less, okay? In order for the authoritative allocation of valued things in a society to be considered C, legitimate, all members of society do not have to like the particular allocation of resources, but most simply must accept it. Does that ring a bell? Okay, good. Laswell's, Easton's, and Fagan's definition of politics all imply that members of the, the members of a society are D in conflict over the things valued by society. We just made that point. Okay. Questions? 
yeah, don't be shy about interjecting because I'm looking at the screen. I might not see a confused look on your face, right? According to the systems model, which of the following refers to any condition or circumstance that is external to the boundaries of the political system being examined? The environment, the environments of the political system, external to the boundaries of the political system. You remember that systems model stuff? It's a long time ago, right? If if any of this stuff doesn't really ring a bell for you, I would encourage you strongly to go back and look at the policy primer, because remember the lecture material was uh, coincided very closely to the information in the policy primer. I mean, you can go back and look at your class notes as well, but maybe the policy for this particular information, maybe the policy primer is the best source. Okay. In which class of public policy does government set standards for behavior, inspect for compliance with the standards, and punish for noncompliance? D, regulatory. So think about, you know, the everyday kind of examples, maybe first or, or the easiest, you know, like something like the speed limit, right? This government sets the standard for your behavior when you get behind the wheel of the car in terms of the speed that you operate your car, 65 miles an hour, let's say, right? And then the police go out and inspect for compliance. And then when they find noncompliance, they issue a punishment. You know, that's characteristic of regulatory policy. The Texas legislature passes and the governor signs a bill that establishes the point. Boy, this one is timely, isn't it? Uh, a bill that establishes the point of viability of a pregnancy at six weeks and prohibits all abortions after that point. The law provides for penalties for abortions performed in the state after the point of viability. This is an example of the D, adoption legitimation stage of the policymaking process and illustrates the regulatory class of policy. Questions about that one? So like the adoption legitimation stage is like... There's a decision being made here. When the legislature passes a bill, the combination of the legislature voting to pass it and the governor signing it, that is making a decision, right? And when we're talking about public policy, the fact that government's doing it is what gives it legitimacy, all right? So adoption slash legitimation. And then when you think about, you know, who's the primary target group of this, well, you could say pregnant women, but you might also include, you know, medical providers that might provide abortion services, right? And what is government doing? Well, it's controlling their behavior, setting standards, inspecting for compliance, punishing for noncompliance. All right. Um, oh, I was in the right spot. Here we go. Uh, suppose a state governor gives a speech in which he says it is the policy of law enforcement in the state to, quote, eliminate rape, rapists from our, the streets of our cities. However, no new statutes are enacted to increase penalties. Levels of state funding to law enforcement agencies in the state remain unchanged. No directives are provided to law enforcement agencies concerning task forces or other units to be established in order to combat this specific crime. What important principle of public policy does this example illustrate? The answer is policy consists of decisions and action. In fact, we made a really big deal about that particular point early in the semester, both in class and in the policy primer, that in order to have public policy, you have to have both. You have to have the decisions and you have to have the subsequent action. Okay. So here, and by the way, this, this also is a, you know, kind of a real world example, isn't it? Because I don't know if you remember a year or so ago, whatever it was that Governor Abbott made the pronouncement that they were going to, you know, the state was going to eliminate rapists from the streets. But in fact, really nothing changed in terms of these kinds of things that I have listed here. So, oh, you got this public statement, but really, is there been any real change in policy? Doesn't seem to be. Okay. Depending on the political society under examination, a variety of institutions or actors may be perceived as having legitimate authority. However, in a C, democratic society, only government institutions are accepted as having such power. We the people, right? The legitimacy of government's authority comes from we the people. Well, I don't, we really didn't even, you know, in our lecture presentations, we really didn't even 
use those terms. Sometimes I throw terms out, those are actual terms, but sometimes I just put terms on a multiple choice test that not to, not, my purpose is not to throw you off, it's actually, my purpose is actually to help you eliminate possibilities. Right? Hey, I don't remember us dealing with plutocratic, that can't be it, right? We didn't deal with bureaucratic, I mean, you know, in that, the context of the discussion that we're having on this, so that can't be it either. So you're kind of eliminating options just by, you know, eliminating those two. Government, as discussed in class lecture, can best be defined as the structured arrangements in a society that produces and enforces decisions resolving conflicts over. Uh, it says E there, but it actually is D, and I do I do remember changing that on the when I scored the you know uh, noticing that that was incorrect and it was scored properly. Okay, so, but the answer there it should say D, scarce resources. All right, and uh, finally, number 10, which stage of the policymaking process involves government doing the things to or for the primary target group that are authorized by the policy statement? The answer is A, implementation. Okay, any questions about those? Let me ask this, this question. Do you want me to proceed to lecture quiz number two, or do you want to go to reading quiz number one? You want to do reading quiz number one? Okay, there's some logic to that. All right, so here we go with the reading quiz. This was from the first two weeks of the semester, which was mainly the policy primer, but it, also that handful of pages um, in chapter 11 or whatever it is. Okay. All right, so uh, inputs into the political system include demands for specific policy actions and general support for the political system or one of its parts. What do, what do you remember? I, I don't show you the answer here yet. Okay. Well, so if that doesn't ring a bell for you, maybe that's a clue to you need to go back and look at the policy primer again. Okay. The answer to that is true. Yeah, it's true. Okay. Don't be shy, Riley. Go ahead and throw it out. After all, you've already taken this quiz, right? So the worst thing that happened here is I can just say no. Okay. Yeah, but no, it is true. That, that's exactly what we mean by inputs. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration inspects a plastics factory looking for levels of vinyl chloride in excess of federal standards. This is an example that is most consistent with the implementage, implementation stage of the policymaking process. True. Good, John. Yeah, that's exact. You know, think about OSHA inspectors kind of like police officers. Right, they're inspecting for compliance with standards. That's implementation. In the systems model usage, the Republican Party is a conversion structure. Oh, you gotta go. You're you're being challenged here to remember way back to the beginning of the semester, right? Week one of the semester, 15 weeks ago. Um, Again, this may be, you know, the specific terminology may be something that you can go back and look at in the policy primer, but the answer to this is false. It's not a conversion structure, it's an input structure. An input structure. Okay. A conversion structure refers to government institutions. So like if this said the Texas legislature instead of the Republican Party, the answer would be true. Well, an input structure, it's about the functions, right? What is the function of input structures? It's to communicate demands and expectations that people have, to channel demands and supports into government, right? Well, and, and what is the function? The and it converts them into policy outputs. That's the function of government. Good, Martin. Very good. A city council passes and the police enforce an ordinance imposing fines on the parents of minor children who are on the streets past 1 a.m. The scenario is an example of resource extractive policy. It's actually false. It's regulatory policy. I mean, some, it's, it's, I've discovered in the past that it is difficult sometimes for students to distinguish between resource extractive and regulatory policy, 
because, you know, like um, here, you know, maybe parents would think about the government taking something from them, that a fine is, you know, the government taking something, but it's really just the mechanism to change behavior, right? What the government's doing here is setting a standard for compliance. Parents, you got to keep get your children and make sure your children are in before 1 a.m., right? And if you don't, we're going to impose a punishment on you. There's a punitive aspect. Of, this, this is punitive in nature, right? You don't do what the government says. The standard is if you fail to comply with the standard, government's going to impose a punishment on you. Just like, again, to use the example of police officers giving you a traffic citation. So, That's not resource extractive, even though you're having to pay money. It's a it's the enforcement mechanism to get you to change your behavior. So resource extractive policy would be like, yeah, like a tax policy. So what government's doing there is not necessarily trying to change your behavior. It is raising revenue. In order for policy to be perceived as legitimate by the general public or by specific segments of the public at which at which the policy is directed, it must be developed by the president at the national level, the governor at the state level, and the mayor at the city level. Or is is policy just developed by executives, chief executives? No, it can be developed by legislatures. It can be developed by courts, bureau, bureaucrats, right? Not just exec, not just chief executives. So that's false. In regulatory policy, government sets standards for behavior, inspects for compliance with standards. Yeah, we've we've addressed this now three times, right? Okay, so that's true. Good. You should have that down, you know, like nothing else from this early part of the semester, you should have regulatory policy down. The substance of public policy is determined by what government actually does, not by what it says it will do or by the objectives that motivate the policy. Yeah, that's a, the point of heavy emphasis that we saw just a few minutes ago with the lecture quiz. True. According to the authors of Governing Texas, policymakers are often constrained by bounded rationality and tend to engage in satisfying, satisfying decision making. Okay, so here is some terminology that is 15 weeks old for you. Well, not really, because you were supposed to re read chapter 11 as, uh, in anticipation of the reading quiz, reading quiz 7. So it's not that old. The answer to that is true. So go back and look at that those hint, that handful of pages, 407 to 411 or whatever, and make sure you understand what they mean by bounded rationality and satisfies them. They have to satisfy the decision making. Well, satisfying behavior means that basically getting, you do what is politically feasible. Right? Mm -hmm. Did you get enough people to agree on, right? It's kind of the, that's not the way they, exactly the way they define it, but that's kind of the area that they're trying to get you to understand is that what happens when, when government makes decisions, a lot of times it's not, it's not the decision that anyone really thinks is committed to or convicted that it's going to work. It's what we can actually get enough people to agree on. because there are some boundaries placed by rational behavior on, you know, the options. According to the authors of tech, Governing Texas, the constitutional features of American government allow chief executives to wield unilateral policymaking authority in most circumstances, relegating other, brand, other institutions such as legislatures and courts to substantially diminished roles. No, that's false. I mean, we just kind of touched on that a minute ago, right? Um, Legislatures are very relevant. Courts are very relevant. Bureaucratic agencies are very relevant. It's not just about the authority of chief executives. It's a system of shared powers. Not, it's not a system of command. All right. The authors of uh, Texas, Governing Texas outline the public policy making process exactly the same way that I do in the policy primary. No, that's false. They have, I think, four stages and mine has five stages, but there's certainly overlap between the two. Okay, good. Questions about those public policy topics? All right, ready to move to lecture quiz two?
see what how you much you remember there. According to LSR, which culture types are apparent in Texas? Moralistic, traditionalistic, individualistic, liberal. What is it? See, oh, it's the answer's there for you already. Okay. So it's two and three. Traditionalistic is the dominant culture type, individualistic is the subculture. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if you're stronger on the things that you did discussion posts on. I mean, I, I can't design that study at this point, but I would, I would personally find that interesting to see because that would tell me whether or not there is much value to those discussion posts. Uh, LSR explains geographical patterns of culture types in terms of immigration, given Texas is dominant culture type. From where is it reasonable to conclude that most of the state's early Anglo settlers came from? The answer is the American South. Remember the 19th century patterns of migration were basically east to west. So the early Anglo settlers in Texas came from places like South Carolina and Tennessee and Georgia and the American South. They didn't come from Connecticut and Massachusetts. Who came from Europe? Well, again, LSR's culture type is uh, LSR's culture types are based on the patterns that were established in the United in the British colonies in America from the founding of those colonies. Okay, so he says that the moralistic culture type is the New England colonies, the individualistic type is the middle Atlantic colonies and the traditional culture type is established in the southern plantation colonies. And then the United States declare their independence and the frontier begins to expand westward. By the time we get to the tail end of the 18th century, by the time we get to the tail end of the 1700s, early part of the 1800s, rapidly expanding across the continent. But when people moved during the 18th century, they did so basically, not without exception, but basically on a pattern due west. So that the early Anglo settlers who came to Texas in the 1830s, in the 1840s, well, really beginning in the 1820s, but certainly the 1830s and the 1840s were coming from places like Tennessee and South Carolina. You know, think about the names and the founding of Texas. Um, you know, the names that you see on around this area, the Texas Gulf Coast, you know, Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston and Jane Long and Mirabu Lamar and, you know, all these all these names that, you know, you see around here. They weren't born in Texas, right? Where did they come from? Oh, you know, the American South. But it's not just the names that we recognize. It's the people who came to Austin's colony. Right? The, you know, they, they, that's where they were from. Okay, sorry. Uh, here we go. Number three. Which of the following is given the highest priority in an individualistic political culture? The answer is economic development. According to LSR, if you can't get people in an individualistic culture to agree on anything else, it's going to be the importance of economic development. In which of LSR's culture types would we expect voter turnout to be high in comparison to the other two culture types? Oh, I bet you remember this one. The answer is B, moralistic. Where do we see the highest levels of voter turnout in the United States? Oh, Minnesota, Vermont, New Hampshire, North Dakota, where it can regularly, historically, you know, has been, you know, 65, 75% of the eligible electorate, as opposed to a place like Texas, where it's down around 45%, you know, in pre we're talking about presidential elections. 45 to 50 percent, something like that. Which of the following describes an effect of a tax in which individuals and households have higher incomes that have higher incomes pay a lower effective tax rate? We dealt with this very recently. In fact, we even took a quiz today. <laughs> yeah, regressive. 
according to Daniel Ellis, our scheme states with traditionalistic political culture provide a lower level of benefits and social welfare programs like TA and F and SNAP than states with a moralistic political culture because the former culture type does not support policies that upset the existing social, economic, and political order. Anytime you see those three fill in the blanks on the multiple choice questions, those are always the most challenging, right? The American emphasis on constitutionalism can best be understood as an effort to C, limit the power of government and prevent the abuse of governmental authority. Again, stop me if you have questions. The current Texas Constitution has been in effect since 1876. Since 1876, the Texas Constitution has been amended approximately 500 more times. And then finally, whereas the U.S. Constitution emphasizes specific denials of authority, the Texas Constitution emphasizes specific grants of authority. So the implication here is if it's not specifically denied, government can do it. Does anybody remember the technical term I gave you to suggest that idea? If it's not specifically denied, and it's not, and there is some reasonable basis in the Constitution. The uh, technical term that I gave was plenary. The powers of government are considered to be plenary, P-L-E-N-A-R-Y. Okay. Questions about that lecture material? Shall we go to reading quiz two? Is that where, we, where you want to go next? Okay. Texas's political life grew out of the Gulf Coastal Plains. That is true. Because that's just where the early, and again, you know, they're talking about Anglo settlement in Texas, right? So Austin's colony was just down the road over here. So it's, you know, here in this area, right? Washington on the Brazos. San Jacinto. Goliad. Um, you know, all those places are this part of Texas Gulf Coast Plains. Business interests have consistently dominated the Texas political culture. Okay, good. The Great Recession hit Texas particularly hard, with Texas being one of the first states to enter and one of the last to exit. When was the Great Recession? 2008, 2009, 2010. Okay. Is that what the authors of your textbook tell you? It hit Texas particularly hard? No, Texas was actually one of the last to enter and one of the first to exit. It didn't hit Texas. As bad as it might have been in Texas, it didn't hit Texas as bad as it did most other states. The Great Recession, not the Great Depression. Right. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah. Political culture is static and does not change. False? Good. It's dynamic. All major statewide elected offices have been controlled by Republicans since 1988. Well, this is false because it's going back a little bit too far. Okay. 1996. It doesn't go quite back as far as 1988. Okay? But it's been 25 years. You know, it's been almost three decades, which is a long time. There are rights guaranteed to Texans in Article One of the Texas Constitution that go, go far beyond those of the U.S. Constitution. Yeah, the answer to that is true because remember, this statement is based on what the authors of your textbook tell you, but I think that could be misinterpreted. I think really all the authors of your textbook mean by that is that there's a lot more verbiage in Article One of the Texas Constitution. And even there are some specific rights, like, say, gun owners' rights. I mean, all the U.S. Constitution says there is the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, right? But the Texas Constitution, in Article 1, 
there's a lot more with respect to gun owners' rights than the, you know we find in the U.S. Constitution. But mainly, it's just a matter of, I mean, verbiage. It's not necessarily in terms of protection of rights. The Texas Constitution of 1869 was written by the members of the Republican Party, including 10 elected African Americans. That's true, right? That's the Reconstruction Constitution, right? The one that Texas and the other Southern, you know, in Texas that happened in 1869, but the Southern states were compelled by Congress to write new constitutions as conditions of readmission into the Union, okay? Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to uh, make an output that I got the question wrong when we took the test. You can remember getting it wrong? Yeah. But you, you got it very quickly. Just, oh, you remember because you got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, remember what the 1869 Constitution did. It was um, a document that... Um, you remember, most Texans at that time would have been... Cons would have been Confederate sympathizers, right? So they were disenfranchised, so white Texans, right? Democrats, they would have been disenfranchised during the Reconstruction period. They would have been denied the right to hold public office during the Reconstruction period. And that meant that Republicans took charge. And the Republicans undertook this agenda, which uh, included a heavy emphasis on promoting civil rights and racial equality. And in Texas, that meant that the Constitution that was written included former slaves who would not have been previously eligible to hold public office, but were. But that's not the current Texas Constitution, right? The current Texas Constitution was written in 1875, and Sometimes you see the Constitution of 1875, sometimes you see the Constitution of 1876 because it went into effect in 1876. I usually say the Constitution of 1876, right? Remember that that Constitution was written in reaction to this, right? So a lot of that 1875 document can be understood as an effort to undo what now white Southern Texans regained their right to vote. They regained their right to hold public office. They came back to power. And the first thing that they do is dispose of this and write a new constitution that they perceive as undoing the conditions of reconstruction. The Texas Constitution of 1876 was designed to expand the power of government, particularly the power of the governor and the lieutenant governor. False, right? The 1870s. What what is one of the problems that Texans, when they wrote this Constitution in 1875, what was one of the problems that they perceived during Reconstruction, that the governor of the state, E. J. Davis, had was corrupt and had abused his authority, and so they wanted to take steps to make sure that you never had another governor that had that kind of authority, and specifically one of the ways that they did that was by taking the power of the governor in dispersing it among a number of uh, other elected officials, the creation of the plural executive arrangement. That is a limitation on the power of the governor. That's why we have always said, you know, for many, many years when we compare governors, we've always said that the Texas governor ranks near the bottom in terms of formal powers. The plural executive is the biggest part of the explanation for that. I thought the Constitution of Texas was practically giving power to, you know, like what the government can do. And the United States. It is, but it, the point is that it doesn't give a lot of power to the governor. Okay. Yeah. Now, as it turns out, in practical application of Texas politics, that the lieutenant governor turns out to be a very powerful political leader, but that's not by virtue of anything that's in the Constitution, except for the fact that he's the presiding officer of the Texas Senate. It's really in terms of the rules of the Senate that allow the lieutenant governor to, to wield such wide-ranging authority. Yeah, the, the Constitution itself is should be thought of as a severe limitation on the power of the, the particularly the governor but also the legislature. Right? That's why we have, 
you know, that's why we have a constitution that requires so much constitutional amendment, because it's, a, it's really the way that they saw to limit the power of the legislature. Uh, voter turnout tends to be very low on constitutional amendments. True or false? True. Yep. And what's the number that we threw out there? That. Okay. That's uh, that's probably. I think you know it depends on it depends on your source material, but some sources will say. You know, on the average, you have maybe between 10 and 12 percent voter turnout, but I've seen some that say it suggests it's under 10 percent. I mean, obviously, some constitutional amendments are going to get more attention than others, and, and therefore higher voter turnout. I love them like this one, sir. Yeah, I mean, the ones that deal in recent years, the ones that deal with high profile social issues, like say same sex marriage back in 2005. That got pretty high voter yeah. turnout, but it still was, I think, less than 25%. But ones that deal with sort of, um, you know, narrowly construed public policy issues, they tend to get a lot less voter. Or even less than that, the ones that deal with things like specific governmental offices in, in one county, you know, like abolishing a particular county office in Rockwall County. Why would people in Harris County care enough to turn out on the question of whether to abolish the office of county surveyor in Rockwall County? Yeah, I mean, I'm a firm believer in rational apathy. Right? If you, it, it's not rational. Yeah, you know, this is going to sound like heresy. I'm not supposed to say things like this, but in a sense, it's not really rational to go vote on the issue that you don't see any connection to your life. Right. It's entirely rational to not vote if you don't see any relevance to your life. Well, that raises the whole question. Well, therefore, if that's true, why why do we have voters deciding these questions? That's a good question. <laughs> Though not intended by its framers, the Texas Constitution became an instrument through which special interests could seek to promote and protect their own agendas. Yeah, that's not only a point that the authors of your textbook make, it's really a point that I tried to hit on pretty heavily in lecture material as well. Okay. Ready to go to lecture quiz number three? Is that where you want to go? No, it's all multiple choice. The form of government indicated by the diagram is D, unitary, right? Everybody remembers this, the idea that the regional governments are really just administrative units. Give me an example of a country that would be this form. Yeah, we, that's one that, I think Cuba too, absolutely, but uh, we didn't mention that one in class. We did mention the UK. What about with respect to Texas state government? Where do we see this form manifest? In the relationship between the state and the counties, right? Counties are just administrative subunits of the state. Federalism is, by the way, also general law cities. Home rule cities, it's a little bit harder to apply this model because home rule cities are not just administrative subunits of the state. They're really, I think, the federalism uh, characterization applies more when we're talking about the relationship between the state and home rule cities. Federalism is most simply defined as a system of government in which governmental power is divided between a central government and regional governments. Yeah, the power, the, the power of government, you see, one's not a, an administrative unit of the other. It's, they both have power that's, you know, uh, granted to them. So like on a charter, well, from like, 
to... Yes, so like in the democratic system, the people. The people give some governments to the national, uh, or some powers to the national government, and some powers to the state governments. That's, that's right. Which of the following is a characteristic of all federal systems? It's actually all of them, right? These were all things that we mentioned in class are characteristics of federal systems. I said a few minutes ago that the fill in the blank, three item fill in the blanks were probably the hardest. Actually, maybe these are the hardest. <laughs> look, because you don't, the, the, you know, the challenge of these kinds is you may not, look, sorry, you may know one, two, four, and five, but you're not sure about three. Okay. Or maybe you know one, two, and four, but you're not sure about three and five, right? So you answer A. You don't get any credit for knowing one, two, and four. <laughs> you had to know all of them. Okay? So that, unfortunately, there's not, fortunately, there's not too many of those uh, multiple combination questions that you saw this semester. I used to use them a lot more extensively. Uh, which of the following is an example of a confederacy? The United States from 1776 to 1789 under the Articles of Confederation. What do you not get? Which of the following is an example of a confederacy? Well, it's not this because we know the United States under the Constitution since 1789 is a federal system, right? And then it was just a matter if you remembered from the class discussion, you know, how we characterize this, but we actually specifically made the point in class discussion that this was uh, the United States was a confederacy during this period from independence to the time that the Constitution went into effect. Under the U.S. Constitution, the national government is a government of delegated powers while the states are governments of reserved powers. Does anybody remember the provision of the U.S. Constitution that really, really drives that theory of the Constitution home? It's the Tenth Amendment, okay? Maybe, you know, make a note of that mental note or a note in your, uh, your uh, notebook or your laptop, you know, that the Tenth Amendment is the relevant provision of the Constitution there. The U.S. Constitution. After the ratification of the 24th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the state of Texas used a dual ballot system as a means to, D, continue requiring voters to pay the poll tax in state and local elections. Texas state law requires the two major parties to use primaries to A, nominate their candidates to run in the general election. The Texas primary is a C. Now remember, this is a lecture quiz. Okay? So I was testing you over how we talked about this in lecture. And in lecture, we said semi-closed. The authors of the textbook say what? They say it's an open primary. Yeah. But I take issue with them. <laughs> okay? And I won't go back and rehash that. But you may remember, right, that I told you at the time that here's one of those times during the semester where I'm going to tell you it's a little bit different than what the authors of your textbook tell you. So what is it? Is it open? Oh, it's what I say. It's, <laughs> it's a, a semi-closed primary. The authors of the textbook are just wrong. Um, the direct primary was an innovation of the progressive reform movement and can best be understood as an, as an attempt on the part of progressives of both political parties to democratize the process of um, nominating party candidates. Poll taxes in state and local elections were prohibited by. So we had the previous question about poll taxes in the 24th Amendment. What did the 24th Amendment do? It made poll taxes illegal in national elections, presidential and congressional elections. Okay? But 
after the 24th Amendment was passed, was ratified, a number of states, including Texas, decided that, well, we may not be able to impose a poll tax with respect to presidential elections or congressional elections, but we're going to continue to do it in governor's elections and in state legislative races and, you know, any other election, local, state and local elections. And the Supreme Court struck that down in the Texas versus the United States and Harper versus Virginia State Board of Elector cases. So yeah. So the key, the key to getting this question correct is to understand that it's talking about state and local elections. If this said poll taxes in national elections were prohibited by, the answer would be the 24th Amendment. But we're talking about state and local elections here, so we have to understand that that was struck down by the court. Where do you want to go next? Because we don't have a whole lot of time left. You want to just continue in sequence? Is there any block of material that we covered this semester that you particularly remember that you would like to return to? Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take one thing off the table, the quiz that you just took, <laughs> because I'm recording this class session and there's still people who are in the online class who need to take that quiz, and we don't want to give them any special <laughs> benefits to getting the getting the que answers to the questions ahead of time. Pick a number, any number. You want more recent material or just want to continue in sequence or? How about reading quiz five? Reading quiz five. Thank you, Martin. Okay, so that was over chapter eight and chapter nine, which was, I think, the material on political parties, wasn't it? Is that? Nope. Sorry, it's the. Oh, it's the executive branch and the judicial branch of Texas government. Okay, so the structure of the Texas executive branch is centralized with much more formal authority. Uh, that's false. We know that's false. The governor makes approximately 3,000 appointments to various state agencies during a single term in office. Uh, it's about half that. Ann Richards was the first woman to serve as governor of Texas. It's false. I didn't remember who it was, but I remember that Ma Ferguson. Ma Ferguson, that's it. Yeah. Really yeah. Ferguson. When when was that, by the way? Like it was it like we know Ann, when was Ann Richards governor? Like early nineties, early nineteen nineties. So when was Ma Ferguson? I think she was, like, I think late 60s, early 60s. Oh, no, earlier than that, like 1920s, like the 1920s, yeah. And you'll remember, I don't remember how much of the story that the authors of your text will tell you. I didn't get into this in class, but she was the wife of Paul Ferguson, James Ferguson, who got into some trouble, right, and was impeached and removed from office. That she became governor, and the, I mean, most historian, most Texas historians will tell you that she was just kind of the the front woman. Right? That Pa was still back there pulling the strings. So Ann Rich, Ann Richards is really the first true governor of Texas. You know, like acting really as governor, but not technically. The Texas governor has strong powers to grant clemency. False. And what's the main reason for that? It has to be at the recommendation of the Board of Pardons and Paroles, right? Like the, go the governor doesn't, doesn't have just the authority to pardon anybody he wants to, like, say, the president can pardon, you know, anybody convicted of a federal crime. State governor, Texas governor can't do that. It has to be recommended by the Board of Pardons and Paroles. Only the controller of public accounts has the ability to submit 
a budget to the legislature. Now, that's not really the role of the controller. The role of the controller is to estimate revenues. But that's important because the legislature can't appropriate more money than the controller's estimate. And typically, are, are the controllers typically um, really conservative about their estimates or are they kind of, you know, um, generous with their estimates? They're pretty conservative with their estimates, right? Because they obviously, they don't want to get blamed for estimating more revenue and then the state finds itself in a real financial pinch. That, re that revenue doesn't materialize. In 1996, the voters of Texas chose to adopt an amendment to the state's constitution setting up a merit selection method for selecting Texas state judges, but the Texas Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional. No, that's never happened in Texas. I mean, that's never been put to the voters. I think people have talked about when they do it, but they never actually put it. Well, there have been some, you know, leadership, some leaders, a few leaders in Texas who have tossed out the idea, but it's never had any real political traction in Texas. And, you know, one explanation that some people offer is that uh, there are too many vested interests in the way that the system works now. Particularly, maybe, say, corporate interests trying to protect their interests at the Texas Supreme Court. One of the biggest controversies concerning the method of judicial selection in Texas is that there may be conflicts of interest when judges hear cases affecting the financial interests of persons who have donated to their campaigns. Well, yeah, I mean, the authors of your textbook make that point. We made a really big deal about that in class sessions. I had, you know, showed you the video, the PBS aired video about, uh, about this issue, not only in Texas, but in a couple of other states as well. All death penalty cases are automatically appealed to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. That's true. Mediation is popular in civil disputes because the parties to the dispute are not forced into a particular decision as they would be with arbitration. That's true. The role of the mediator is to try to get the parties to perceive that they have an interest in a mutually beneficial outcome. The Texas Supreme Court only hears criminal cases. No, they only hear civil cases. Okay, good. Where do you want to go next? Reading quiz seven, the most recent one. Okay. Yeah, information that you posted online uh, about the court cases, how long is this still going to be open? The, the, the videos you gave us to watch about the, um, the how the, the system, the, the, the court systems are, how they work. The links that I provide are only available until the end of the week. So for this class, for example, you're talking about a video recording for the Tuesday class session. So that would be available to you until the end of the day on Saturday of that week. So if you're if you're talking about what I think you're talking about in the area of criminal justice that we dealt with in week 13, yeah. those links have, have gone away. I meant the videos about the court system, you know, where they were sitting. Oh, oh, well, uh, about the judicial selection? Yeah. Uh, that is, uh, the link that I provided has gone away, but that video is still out there if you want to do a search on it. It's called uh, Justice at Stake. Yeah. Justice at Stake. Yeah, you can find that. You say they're open to the, the end of the week next week? No, no. What I'm saying is that that's open to anybody who can do a search on YouTube for Justice at Stake. Because that's not my video. That was the PBS. That's, the, that's PBS's video, right? So you, if you can just go do a YouTube search on Justice at Stake, you should be able to find it. That was very interesting. It was. A, I think it is a very interesting program. Yeah. It was an hour long for each of them. Yes. Was what was the question that you were asking? The, no, uh, I also okay. know the one where like, the uh, lawyers and stuff were talking, but I saw a tablet. Oh, the round table discussion? Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, see, those videos you can, uh, well, you know, actually, this semester is almost over, so I might as well just go ahead and say this. But I, I think that a lot of students figure this out. The links that I provide are only available until the end of the week. But I don't take the videos down off of YouTube. They're there. Right. So one thing that you could do, I don't rec I, I never rec even put that out there for people to think about because I don't want to incentivize people to wait until later to do it. And besides, you're taking the lecture quiz in short order. Why would you want to wait and watch it three weeks from now? That won't do you any good for the lecture quiz. Well, now that we're done with the lecture quizzes, I'll just say that some people figure out, already knew, that all they really have to do is go out there and download the, or, you know, click on the link and then bookmark the link because the YouTube video doesn't go away. Even the, even the lecture sessions from Tuesday and Thursday, they don't go away. They're still there until I go out there and take them off, which may be the sometime only, soon. The only problem is not in order. It's, it's not in order. I went through it. Well, if you say, if you say, if you bookmark them in order, you know, when you, when you bookmark, you click bookmark this tab or whatever it says in your browser, right? And then it has a little field there that has the title. Just put the number one in front of the first one and put the number two in front of the second one. That, right? I mean, I, my sense was that most students these days have figured that out <laughs> like a, a long time ago. But, um, you know, I, I, the way that we're doing, we're doing the quizzes this semester, I don't really think there was any um, incentive to do that. I mean, I tried to set it up in a way that you really need to watch the videos when I link them up because the quiz is imminent. But as I said, now that you've taken all seven quizzes, I don't have to worry about that anymore. For your sake. I don't worry about it for my sake. I worry about it for your sake. You know? I mean, I don't have, I'm not the one who needs to study the material in anticipation of the quiz. Thanks for <laughs> Thanks for making it harder for you, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, we didn't say we wanted to go through this one, right? Or is this the same one? Okay. Uh, we have just enough time to go through this one. In Texas, persons serving time for capital offenses are eligible for parole. False. Although that there was a time when that was would have been true. The, do you want any, any of you know the name Kenneth Allen McDuff? Kenneth Allen McDuff was a, um, bad guy, <laughs> bad guy. He was, um, he was, uh, he, uh, was convicted of kidnapping, rape, and murder of three teenagers in the Dallas Fort Worth area back in the late 1960s. And he was on death row for many years, scheduled to be executed. And then the Supreme Court's decision came down in Furman versus Georgia in the Texas case. So the moratorium on the death penalty was imposed. Um, his sentence was commuted to life in prison, but he was ultimately paroled by the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles. And he went back to his killing ways. And we may not know the final number of how many people he killed, but it was more than two or three. <laughs> um, and uh, he was ultimately convicted and executed for those murders. But um, it's probably the, if, if there's one event that caused the change in Texas law to from the possibility of parole to not the possibility of parole, it was the case of Kenneth Allen. The Sandra Bland Act prohibits individuals from being jailed at any point if the maximum punishment for the suspected offense is a fine. No, that was part of the original proposal. The authors of your textbook tell you that was part of the original proposal, but it got gutted. Yeah, and so, real. Yeah. Know, yeah. It, it mainly had to deal with this first thing here mandates county jails divert people with mental health and mental substance abuse problems. 
In Texas, the legal standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt is only used in felony cases. No, it's both misdemeanor and felony cases. In Texas, jurors determine a guilty verdict by a majority vote. It's unanimous. It has to be unanimous. In Texas, there are some states where it's a majority, but in Texas, it's a unanimous vote. Do you want to finish it off real quick? Okay. In Texas, felony juries are composed of 12 people and misdemeanor juries are composed of six. That is true. With a progressive tax, people with lower incomes pay a lower tax rate People with higher incomes than people with higher incomes. That is true. Remember, it's a direct relationship. As income increases, the effective tax rate increases. As income decreases, the effective tax rate decreases. Texas is an aggressive. Yeah, we don't have a progressive tax structure in Texas, for sure. Much of the money in the state budget lies outside of the direct control of the state legislature. That is true. This concept of dedicated funds. A lot of the money in Texas in the budget is goes into a dedicated fund for highways or dedicated fund for this or that, whatever the case is. Texas is a high tax state and is therefore perceived as a good place to do business. No, it's perceived as a good place to do business because it is a low tax state. Right? Although, you know, not all business people agree with that mentality. You know, some business people I mean, there's a reason why business is located in California, a high tax state, right? Or in Massachusetts, a high tax state, or in New York, a high tax state. Texas maintains a balanced budget because the state constitution requires it. That's true. Nope, the state constitution does require it. And by the way, how do they get around that? By having a constitutional, by having a bond issue, a constitutional election that gives the state permission to debt spend in this for this particular purpose, right? Whatever this is, okay? All right, the last one, Texas state legislature can impose a personal income tax on Texans without requiring voter approval. Yeah, it does require a constitutional amendment all the time before the early 1990s when it wouldn't have, but the constitution was amended to require an addition, another constitutional amendment to do it, yeah. Okay, good. All right, folks, we are just out of time. You can certainly send me questions if, you, if something occurs to you between now, when is our final exam? Thursday. Thursday, between now and Thursday, you can send me a, you know questions by email if you want to. Although be, uh, be mindful that the later you wait to send me a question, the less likely it is you are to get a response. Also keep in mind that I will not be answering questions over the weekend, <laughs> but when I'm back on Monday, I will. There is a study. Are you talking about the study guy? 50, 50 questions, the answer sheet? Yes, yeah, yeah, the Scantron form that you need. It actually has 50 on the front and 50 on the back, but we're only going to be using the front side. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, you too. You did say you were going to post something for the review online, and I still haven't found it. Well, let me show you real quick, okay? It's been out there since the very